let's get a little bit more serious with the other issue here is that we have an unprecedented situation where uh, this guy's being filibustered and maybe uh, John McCain and Lindsey Graham will decide later that they're going to be able to give up the ghost on this. But uh, this is, uh, you know, Harry Reid just about three weeks ago, was it, said, you know, well, we're going to come up with a deal with Mitch McConnell and, um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen anymore. That deal didn't seem to work out too well. No, it hasn't worked out at all. And, I mean, who could have predicted it? Right. You know, I've seen two different accounts of, um, you know, uh, uh, of what went down. One was that uh, that, that um, Harry Reid himself undermined it because he's an institutionalist who believes in the institution of the Senate. And, you know, you don't want to just go and undermine what's a tradition. And undermine um, it by you talking about filibuster reform. Filibustering. Now, here's what I would say to that. Uh, and he could be in the minority someday, and you definitely, you know, you don't want to do the right thing and pass good policies because you could one day be in the minority. Here's what I would say to that. If you were an institutionalist, you would actually take a historical view of how the filibuster has been used in the past and what it's come to represent today and realize that it's completely destroyed uh, comedy in that chamber. It's completely destroyed the legislative process and has turned them into a laughing stock for all other people in all legislative chambers around the world. Um, it used to be used only in extreme circumstances, and quite frankly, it was normally used in the worst of circumstances, as in a, a, uh, a younger uh, uh, bird from, uh, from West Virginia or a Strom Thurmond blocking civil rights legislation. Right. So it's never really been used for the most part, and I, may not, I don't have all of my historical examples in front of me, but it generally wasn't used for the best of reasons in the past. Um, and yet still only for those quote-unquote extreme reasons, like, you know, giving people equality. It wasn't used on a daily basis in the manner in which it is now, where it's become a de facto situation where you just need 60 votes to do anything. So I don't accept that. If Harry Reid really has that kind of an institutional view uh, of protecting the institution, he'd realize that, that the, there's been a culture creep here where this thing has changed from its, how it was originally used, um, and, uh, something that, mind you, is not even in the Constitution, but fine, it's changed from where to, the way it was used, and it needs to be changed because it's being abused now. And we, and we should say, we should say the, the reforms that were being passed, it seems, or, or were being floated, whether it was the uh, talking filibuster, uh, whether it was the affirmative need to get uh, 40 or 41 votes, and in this case, uh, it wouldn't have made a difference. They got the 40 votes, but at least it's, it's clear that they're filibustering. Um, would have just simply raised the bar. It wouldn't have eliminated the opportunity to filibuster when, uh, in the event that uh, the Democrats were in uh, the minority and there was some type of, um, you know, uh, mandate to end Social Security or whatever it was. Uh, they it would simply raise the bar, the level of commitment you would need to stop something. That's all it would Which do. Is, by the way, something that also used to exist that's changed. You know, that the old sort of Mr. Smith goes to Washington, that used to be real. They found a way to make it easy to filibuster, where you don't actually have to be there. You just put, you just say you're doing it. Right. And that's the other thing, that the two reforms in this bill that would have been hugely helpful, um, uh, one of them would have, you know, that, or at least in bills that were being floated by, by, among others, Jeff Merkley, who has become a new champion and hero of mine in many ways, um, the, the the two you're talking about, one was a talking filibuster, which would make an enormous difference, because these guys filibuster things, and they hide in the shadows. Right. And they're saying, you know what, uh, in a democracy where we believe in open debate, if you want to actually block something, get your ass up there. Right. And make your case to people. that you know, and, and be out and be front about it. Don't hide in the shadows like people do in authoritarian regimes. That's number one. Number two, it's the onus is on you. It's no longer on us to get the 60 votes. All right? To, to close it, you need to keep your 41 votes in line. So at any time, you better have your 41 votes there if we call a vote, because if not, we're closing down the filibuster. I think those two things could have been hugely helpful. I, I believe in going even further that the filibuster shouldn't be a permanent thing. It should be something where there's, as each vote goes along, and you may say a vote, one vote a month, one vote a week, however you do it, each time you need that, that, that there's less and less required to, to, for closure. Right. To the eventual point where it's pretty close to just being a bare majority. I think that, that you can delay things, but you can't permanently stop them. You have time to make your case then. I think that that, but that wasn't even being talked about, and that was thrown overboard. So really, the two other measures, which I still think would have been hugely helpful, but Harry Reid didn't do those. Now, to get back to the, the sort of the question of what she was, one question was, you know, did he do it on purpose? And we've just been through that, if he really believes this institutionalist. Right garbage that's, that, that 
it doesn't hold weight here because of how it's changed. The second one was that there were Democrats who just who wouldn't go for it. Who, you know, that he couldn't get the majority together. He couldn't get people together. <clears throat> and my answer to that is, well, then you're not a good leader. Well, and the, then if we're going to make fun yeah. of John Boehner for not being able to get his caucus together and say that he's a failure as a leader, uh, again, you can argue with me, Sam, but I just, I'm at a point now where um, I'm, I, I realize I'm not going to agree with the leader of the Democrats on everything. But uh, apparently if a, if a leader is conflicted because he's from a state that's not a solid blue state, if that's the case with Harry Reid, it certainly is on guns, for example, um, then you know what, then we need Chuck Schumer or Dick Durbin or somebody who I may disagree with on some things, but at least is from a safe state and does, isn't worrying always about their political backside. Is worrying about doing what's well, right. You know, for the, the thing country. I I, and, I, and, I would agree with that. Uh, I I would agree with that that premise right there. We should we should have a, a leader of the Senate that is coming from a blue state who's not encumbered in any way by. Uh, their own reelection, but I, I don't that think. With Tom Daschle too, I'll just right. say quickly the but, same thing as we have with Harry Reid. But but I mean, I don't think Harry Reid was influenced by what the voters in Nevada thought about the filibuster. I mean, there's just you know the percentage of people in uh, this uh, this country who um, are interested in the filibuster uh, of your typical voter. It's got to be somewhere around zero. I just want to make that clear. That's right. not no, what I'm I agree with that. Here, I think guns, however, that do, yes. I think in other cases. And it influences what he does. I think in this one, you're right. This There's is no more doubt. About Assault weapon ban, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. He's not pushing hard enough on these things. And he can embarrass, uh, you know, the, there's there's two things. And, and, and we'll transition into the State of the Union uh, uh, in, in a moment. But I think the one thing that was important about the State of the Union, which is also the case that Harry Reid has the ability to do, it's one thing to say that they there is an inability to push through a piece of legislation. It is another thing to say, if we're not going to get this legislation, we're going to cause opponents of that legislation to pay a political price. Because ultimately, that moves the ball somewhat forward as you start to wear down uh, the opposition by making them pay a political price. Now, I don't know. I've heard uh, a couple of different stories like you have about why uh, Harry Reid cut that deal with Mitch McConnell about the filibuster. I've heard that had he not done a best faith effort to do that, he would not have had the 51 votes that he needed to reform the filibuster. I don't know if that's true or not. It doesn't, I mean, but at the end of the day, it, one has to ask, okay. what's it going to take? I mean, but you can know. you imagine Lyndon Johnson not getting those fifty-one votes? Right. I mean, I'm just saying. At some point, you go get those. You know, l- let me not use words that, so that you can still share this wonderful program with We Act Radio. Right. Um, but l- you go get those votes, and if you can't, then stop. Then step down because right. you're no longer an effective leader. If you can't do what is the, in the interest of center-left progressive governance in what is the interest of your party and in the interest of your country, considering at this point in time, democratic policy on most issues happens to be aligned with the public uh, public approval in a way that it hasn't for a few decades now. Um, I feel, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, I feel like on a number of issues we've always been more aligned, but on so, some, certainly certain social issues where, that, where the country, um, gay rights, for example, and on guns and other things where the country has moved remarkably in a direction of where we are. You know, you can make this argument 15 years ago, we have to play defense. It's no longer that way. Right. It's about playing offense, and it's about stopping the people that will obstruct the progress and the kind of coalition that just, you know, push through these unbelievable changes that we've discussed many times on your show, well and this, beyond just electing President Obama. This gets... All the other ballot measures and, and you know, openly gay members of Congress elected and the rest. And it's just time to stop that. And, well, and well, this gets to my point about the... This gets my point about making... Uh, your opponents pay a political price because now one argument I've heard as to why the institutionalists were not willing to go that far with uh, the filibuster was that even if they pass something out of the Senate, those bills that we're talking about would end up dying in the House. But, but, and this is, and, and, and I want to transition into the State of the Union because of this, um, that if these things came out of the Senate, it would isolate those members in the House that are obstructing this, and in this case it would be about 200. Um, it would, it would f- 
firmly and squarely put the failure of certain uh, legislation that has popular support in the country, uh, that it's failure to get uh, codified into law, onto the these House members. And so the point being that you will make you you may not be able to move legislation forward, but you will make them you will extract a political price, which ultimately will bring you closer to the day when you can move that legislation forward. And that has been you know and and and.